the session of mathematical physics. And I'm very happy to introduce Professor Anton Alexev. Um, he got his degree in um, Circle of Mathematical Institute under the supervision of Prof. Fatiev and Shastri. And he has been working on this simplex geometry and moment map and its interaction with mathematical physics and representation theories. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. I'm happy to be here in Seoul and uh, well, I'm grateful to the program committee for, for the opportunity to speak here. Well, uh, the topic of my talk is around the Gelfand Cycling Integrable System. So let me say some words about the motivation, why we're interested in this system, and in particular why I'm interested in this system. Well, it's a, it's a nice integrable system. It's uh, on the one hand sufficiently simple, so I'm going to describe it in detail in some minutes from now, and on the other hand, uh, well, it was discovered about 30 years ago, <laughs> it, it continues to be a very interesting topic for research. Uh, well, it, uh, it has many facets, it's related to many topics in different fields of mathematics. It's rooted in representation theory, because Gelfand and Zeitlin, they didn't work on integrable models, they uh, actually were interested in, rep in representation theory of the unitary group, and that's where the Gelfand and patterns uh, came about. In fact, uh, in this conference, but in the combinatorics section, there is a talk by Gregory Arshansky uh, on the Gelfand Zeitlin patterns, even though he spells the, the name of the second author Zeitlin in a different way. But I, I assume this, <laughs> these, are the same, these are the same patterns. Uh, well, I also have a somewhat personal reason to speak about it. Uh, in fact, uh, the Gelfand Zeitlin integrable system was a topic of uh, my master's thesis. Even though I, uh, I succeeded in getting my master's degree, uh, I haven't been able to solve the problem that uh, my supervisors gave me. And, well, you will still find this problem uh, later in my talk on the list of open problems. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but now I hope I have some ideas on, uh, on what to do about it. Well, uh, let me show you the plan of my talk. In fact, I said uh, we'll see some new things about uh, Gelf and Zeitlin. And, uh, well, in the, so there will be a two part, in, in the first two parts of my talk, I'll tell you about the traditional standard approach to Gelf and Zeitlin using uh, the rather standard, the rather elementary linear algebra, eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices, and uh, also rather standard Poisson geometry. And then we'll switch to some very different universe to the theory of uh, planar networks and uh, with Boltzmann weights on their edges. It turns out that both these themes, both these topics, the eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices and their submatrices, and uh, those uh, weighted planar networks, so two topics which at first sight have nothing to do with each other, they are governed with, by the same system of inequalities, the so-called interlacing inequalities. So, and then in this uh, third part, I'll try to see, I will try to tell you something about why this relation is possible. In fact, uh, this is still a work in progress. We, we don't quite understand this relation. It looks like there is some new scheme for, uh, for building integrable models, which is uh, uh, emerging from, uh, from these considerations. And in the open problems part, I'll try to show you some of those uh, models or some of those systems where we hope uh, to build a completely integrable structure using, uh, using, uh, uh, using these uh, Poisson Lie groups and flat connections, this machinery that I explained in the, in the third part. Okay, well, uh, let me start with, uh, uh, with a standard background. Uh, we build integrable systems on Poisson manifolds. So a Poisson manifold is a manifold uh, with a bivector, a section of the second uh, exterior power of the tangent bundle. Then we can build, uh, using this bivector, we can build a skew symmetric bracket on functions. 
and uh, the manifold is called Poisson if this bracket is a Lie bracket. Now, uh, there is a one very famous and very standard example of uh, Poisson structures. And given a Lie algebra, let's say, to simplify things, a finite dimensional Lie algebra, then its dual is automatically a Poisson manifold. And the theorem of Kirillov, Constant, and Suryo uh, says that there is a unique Poisson structure on this dual of the Lie algebra such that for linear functions, so the linear functions are naturally elements of G, right? The dual of the dual, if, if they are in finite dimensions, uh, reproduces the Lie bracket. So there is this Poisson structure, and we'll be interested in one particular example of such a Poisson structure. So let's denote by Hn the set of Hermitian and by n matrices. And uh, note that uh, this space is a natural duality to the Lie algebra of the unitary group. Right? We can imagine the Lie algebra of the unitary group as being uh, skew Hermitian matrices. Now take a product of a Hermitian and skew Hermitian matrix and take a trace. So the result is purely imaginary. So if we take the imaginary part of it, uh, it will be a perfect duality between, between these two spaces. So we can think of Hn as a dual to a Lie algebra, in this case, dual to the unitary Lie algebra, and this implies that Hn is naturally a Poisson space. So that's on this Poisson space that the Gelf and Zeitlin integral system lives. Now, um, just to recall the definition of a completely integral system, uh, so we, uh, uh, we, cons we consider, we take a, a Poisson manifold, m pi, and we look at a set of functions, a finite set of functions, uh, which defines a completely integral system if it satisfies the following conditions. First of all, these functions should be in involution, which means that they have vanishing Poisson brackets with each other. And then their differential should be linear independent, which means that the wedge product of these differentials is non-vanishing. And finally, we require that it is a maximal family with these properties. So we cannot add one more function. Well, in fact, uh, here it's, it's, it's somewhat flexible, this definition. For instance, the differentials being linearly independent, well, you can require them to be linearly independent on an open, dense subset. You, you don't kind of, sometimes you can accept that they, they become dependent. Also, when we say that the functions are smooth, in, we, can, we can also relax it a little bit. We can say that they're smooth on some open, dense subset. In particular, well, why, why do I go in such details? That's because the Gelf and Zeitlin integrable system is, in fact, has non functions which are not smooth everywhere. So they have some singular loci. Well, now, what is, what is Gelf and Zeitlin? Uh, here, I would need a little bit of notation. Let's say A is a Hermitian n by n matrix. Well, then we will denote by AK its principal K by K submatrix, which is sitting in the upper left corner. Uh, of course, it's also a Hermitian K by K matrix. And uh, we'll also denote by lambda the map from HN to RN, which associates to A its set of ordered eigenvalues. So we take eigenvalues lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on, lambda n. We order them, and that's, that's the map lambda. Now we have uh, associated to our matrix A, we have a family of submatrices of different sizes, and we compute all their eigenvalues. So let's note them by lambda ki. So this, uh, this is the eigenvalue number i of the submatrix of the size k. Um, well, in 1983, Gilman and Sternberg proved the following theorem. Uh, so the functions lambda ki on Hermitian matrices endowed with the KKS Poisson bracket define a completely integrable system. In fact, uh, they proved uh, a much better result. So they proved that lambda ki's are actually uh, action variables of a completely integrable system. In more detail, this means that if you run the Hamiltonian flows of those lambda ki's, they will all give you circles, with, in fact, with the same period. Period you can normalize, say, to pi or 1, so choose a number that you prefer. So lambda ki's are, in fact, normalized action variables. So um, 
Well, in fact, one can visualize, uh, visualize this set of variables in terms of so-called triangular tableau. These are, these are triangular patterns which were invented by Gelford and Seitman in their representation theoretic problem. But you can also use them in this symplectic or Poisson geometry setup. So uh, we, uh, we have a triangular tableau of size n, and in the top row, we write uh, the ordered eigenvalues of our n by n matrix. And then in the next row, we write the eigenvalues of this n minus 1 by n minus 1 corner, and then up to lambda 1, 1, which is the eigenvalue of the 1 by 1 Hermitian matrix, which is just the uh, matrix element which is sitting in the upper left corner of our matrix. OK. In fact, uh, there is, a, there is a statement, I call it proposition, but this, this is something that we can sometimes we teach our first year uh, undergraduate students in the course of linear algebra, or at least, well, if we don't, in principle, we can. So the, 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 the set of eigenvalues of matrices and their submatrices satisfy a so-called interlacing inequalities. So you can imagine it. On this, uh, on this tableau as follows. So the interlacing inequalities go in a zigzag between the rows of the tableau. So this lambda n1 is bigger than lambda n minus 1, 1, which is bigger than lambda n2, and so on. And there is such a zigzag between, uh, uh, f between the, uh, the pairs of consecutive rows. Well, uh, I'm not sure whether, whether we're supposed to give proofs in these talks, but for this statement, I decided to, to give you a proof. Especially, let's, okay, of course, that's a very elementary stuff, but let's compare it with, with what happens in the second part of the talk. So why, why is it actually true? So here is the proof of the first inequality. Uh, we use the minimax principle for eigenvalues, and we notice that, uh, well, we have to choose the subspaces of dimension i, for, for these two, for these two uh, eigenvalues, we have to choose subspaces of dimension i for this eigenvalue in, su in, 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 this, in the subspace ck of cn, and uh, for this eigenvalue in the space ck minus 1. <coughs> so this is uh, minimax, and in particular, the last, the last step is a max over the bigger set of subspaces for this guy. What is that? Oh, yeah, right. This is a mistake on the slide. Oh. So it should be, it should be A. a. Well, I, I did hope nobody would notice, but well, <laughs> OK, so yeah, cross it out, say A. Uh, well, so in, in this way, we, show, we, we see that this, uh, this eigenvalue is bigger than this eigenvalue. Now, well, as I said, I don't know whether we're supposed to give proofs, but I'm quite sure we're not supposed to give exercises. <laughs> but, uh, but I still do, so prove the second inequality. In fact, well, here is a hint. You can either do it with some other minimax principle, or you can add one phrase to this proof. You can use the first inequality to prove the second one. So figure out which phrase one should add. OK, so here is an example of how it works in the, in the case of 2 by 2 matrices. Uh, I've chosen uh, a, a two by two traceless matrix to, uh, to simplify things. And well, two by two traceless Hermitian matrices that the same as our space R3. So we can think of elements here as three dimensional vectors. Now, the Gelfan Seitzen pattern is given in terms of the length of this vector R, and of course it's negative minus R, and in terms of this upper left corner Z. So the interlacing inequalities in this case are very simple inequalities. The z-coordinate of our three-dimensional vector is bounded from above by its length and from below by minus length. Uh, well, maybe one more thing you want to do with interlacing inequalities. Of course, we had a very beautiful picture. Let's change notation to make it somewhat less beautiful. Uh, well, let's, let's introduce those partial sums of eigenvalues. 
we take a matrix of size k, and this LKI will be the sum of the first i eigenvalues. We also add artificially uh, the LK0, which is just 0 for all k. Then uh, a simple proposition says that the interlacing inequalities for lambda are equivalent to the following set of uh, somewhat less appealing inequalities for L's. However, perhaps I will sh uh, the, the following uh, picture the, uh, that allows to visualize these inequalities, perhaps it would convince you that this is also a nice set of inequalities. So, in fact, this picture was invented by Knudsen and Tao uh, for a much more difficult problem, the so-called Horn problem about eigenvalues of sums of Hermitian matrices. However, we can also use it for our purposes, for the, uh, for the interlacing inequalities. So let's again fill the triangular tableau, but now with L's. So a similar triangular tableau which is filled with L's. You see that uh, the triangulation consists of small triangles. Those small tr pairs of those small triangles, they form small rhombi. So there are three different orientations of those rhombi. This, is, this would be a northwest, like this uh, red rhombus, uh, or northeast, like a blue rhombus, and there would be also a south orientation, but we don't use it here. So that the south orientation is used for solution of the horn problem. Now, for, for the rhombi of these two orientations, we have the following uh, simple way to write inequalities. So given such a rhombus, uh, we're saying that the sum of uh, entries on the short diagonal is uh, greater or equal than the sum of entries on the long diagonal. So and these are exactly the inequalities for L. So here, now we visualize them. This is the set of inequalities for blue and red rhombi. So uh, that's a brief intro into the uh, Gauff and Zeitlin integrable system. We see that it's an integrable system on the, uh, uh, on the space of Hermitian matrices with the linear KKS Poisson bracket. And uh, these action variables, they are governed by the interlacing inequalities. We have several presentations for them. Now, as I promised, we'll switch to some absolutely different universe. So we'll forget for a moment about the Poisson geometry, about Hermitian matrices, and we'll speak for some time about planar networks and weights. So at first sight, these two topics have nothing to do with each other, but then of course we'll see that there are some relations. So let's let's go to, 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 the, to the another universe and speak about planar networks. So what is a planar network? In fact, this definition comes from the theory of total positivity. So a planar network of rank n is a finite oriented planar graph, which we imagine on the Cartesian plane with a coordinate with a fixed coordinate system x y. So it satisfies several conditions. First of all, uh, this graph should be contained between two vertical straight lines. So here in the examples, I didn't draw those straight lines, but you can imagine they run vertically through those, uh, those endpoints with numbers. So here are two examples of planar networks. So the second condition, the edges of gamma are segments of straight lines. They are oriented and their projections on the x axis are all positive. You see here, I didn't, didn't draw orientations, but we should imagine that everything goes from left to right. For instance, here those slanted edges, they are oriented downwards because this would be an orientation from left to right. And finally, there is this number n, which would correspond in the end to the size of the matrices, and gamma should have exactly n sources on the left straight line and exactly n sinks on the right straight line. So here are two examples of uh, planar networks of rank 3. Now, uh, we would need the notion of so-called multi-parts in planar networks. So a multi-part is just a collection, so if say k parts is just a collection of k-oriented parts which go from L to R. And they're not allowed to touch each other. So they don't have common vertices, they don't have common edges. Valence, is it always three? Oh, no, absolutely not. It, it, can be, it can be anything. In fact, well, maybe I should have, well, already, 
already here the, the valence is, is not is not it's three, right? Three. Here, here it's 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 one, right? Here draw on the but yeah it can be it can be it can be anything. In fact, you can also consider an empty planar network. It's not very interesting, but any so no, it can be anything. No no conditions with the exception of the conditions that I uh, that are listed here. So uh, so here, for example, this is a one pass. So this, this is a pass which goes from left to right. And here is a two pass, right? So this, this, there are two blue pots, and they don't touch each other. OK. Now, two more notions that we need. These are subnetworks and weightings. Uh, so maybe let's start with weightings. So, well, we're going we're gonna to use weightings in the so-called tropical semi-ring. So this is uh, real axis together with the minus infinity added. In fact, if it bothers you, forget about this minus infinity. We can, in the first approximation, we can just think of real weightings. So uh, we associate weights to edges of, of our graph. And if we have uh, a collection of edges, then the corresponding weight is just the sum of weights on the, on, on the edges. For instance, if we, if we take parts, uh, a weight of a path is just the sum of weights of all the edges of the corresponding path. Now, what about subnetworks? There is one simple way to build subnetworks. Let's just uh, cross out the last n minus k sources and sinks and delete all the edges which have them as endpoints. So this would give a planar network of rank k. For instance, here I can delete for instance, the last three, you see, I, in a strange way, I don't quite know why, I count them from one to, to n, starting from below. <coughs> so if I want to delete, for instance, the last three, I would delete this, uh, these sources and then the corresponding edges, and here the last three things. So this would give a planar network with a small number of uh, sources and things. Now, uh, finally, we need something which replaces either eigenvalues or the, those combinations of eigenvalues which were else. So I denote them M's. And these are the following functions on the weights. So we say that MKI will be a maximum weight of the pass, which is an I pass in the network gamma K. So I only keep the first K sources and first K things and I consider an I path. In fact, from here, it's already clear that I cannot be bigger than K. Because remember, they're not allowed to touch each other. But since we only have K sources and K things, if I is bigger than K, then they would necessarily touch each other at the, at the beginning and at the end. So that's, that, that's here that this minus infinity Comes, becomes useful. You see, you can choose any planar network. In particular, it might happen that some of those path spaces are empty. In this case, of course, we don't quite know what to do with the corresponding weight. And here, it would be logical to, to put it equal to minus infinity. But of course, we can take care and choose planar networks such that it never happens. Then we really don't need this, uh, this arrangement with minus infinity. We also artificially, as before, I introduced MK0, so a zero pass. So we don't need to draw anything. And we put MK0 equal to zero for all k. Just, uh, just a small remark. Uh, so those, uh, those weights, they're piecewise linear functions. So those M's are piecewise linear functions of our weights. So here, W's are sums of uh, weights of edges in the pass. And here we have a maximum function. So these are some piecewise complicated. Depends on the network, right? So sometimes complicated, sometimes easy functions of, uh, of the of the weights. So um, here comes the, the theorem, uh, which uh, which shows that actually there is a relation between the story that uh, that we were discussing before, the story of uh, of the Gelfand cycle, and the uh, and the story of planar networks. You see, let's take any planar network of, well, it should be rank, so I call it rank, but here I, I, I write type, whatever. Uh, planar network of rank n. So then, uh, for any, for an arbitrary weighting that you put on the edges, 
the functions m, those maxima over multiparts, will satisfy the interlacing inequalities. Well, so it shows, at least it's an indication that there might be some relation between, between the, two, the two questions. Uh, well, in fact, remember we had eigenvalues in the, in the problem about matrices. Here, if you want, we can also introduce eigenvalues. This theorem here will imply that those eigenvalues, or whatever, these functions that we can call eigenvalues, they are automatically ordered. So it's, it's an easy consequence of these inequalities. Perhaps one very, very simple example. Let's take uh, the case of n equal to 2 and such a simple planar network. I also chose some weights to be equal to 0, to have only three weights in the game. So I have weights A, B, and C. So we see this m to 1. That's the weight of the maximal pass in this, in this planar network. But in this planar network, there are only three paths. So there is this horizontal path, there is a horizontal path here, and there is this path with a slanted edge. So their weights are A, B, and C. So this guy is just a maximum of A, B, and C. Well, for instance, this guy, that's a maximum path in the network where I killed the, the second source and the second sink. But here, well, there is just one path. It's this horizontal guy. So it's equal to C. <coughs> One, one small remark. We can consider this map from A, B, and C to the triple, to the triple of, of those M functions, of, this, of those maxima of multiparts. Notice that it is of full rank if B is bigger than the maximum of A and C. Indeed, you see, so C is already used here in this function. A is then used in this function. So if you don't use B here, it's going to be lost, right? And the map is not going to be of full rank. So the only way for this map to be of full rank is for B to win this competition between A, B, and C. So this, this, uh, this pass has to be maximal for the, uh, for the map to be of maximal rank. It's going to come up later, later in the talk, this, this consideration. So the interlacing inequalities here are just easy, easy to verify. They basically say that the maximum of, of A, B, and C is bigger than A, B, and C. Well, maybe uh, just a short idea of the proof. Let's choose one of the inequalities, one of these interlacing inequalities. Here, well, I wrote in some detail a somewhat awful formula. What, what does this inequality say? This inequality say that the maximum over the weights of uh, one part in a big network, gamma k, and two parts in a, in a smaller network, uh, k minus one. So here gamma is missing, I think, and here, here as well. Sorry. Too many misprints, I know this. So it's uh, bounded by the max over weights of uh, two uh, of two parts in the, in the big network and one part in the small network. So why is it true? In fact, the best proof is by drawing. Let's imagine what, what we actually want to prove. So here I picture the typical configuration, one part in a big network, that's this blue part, and uh, two parts in a small network, that's this red part. So how can we hope to prove such an inequality? The best way would be to recolor the edges here such that this configuration of parts would turn into this configuration of parts, right? So that, that would be the optimal proof. And actually that's what happens. See, I redraw it as a two parts in a big network and a one part in a small network. And this is always possible. So every time as you write such an inequality, it would be possible to make such a redrawing. Now, uh, I'm not sure whether you are ready for the second exercise. Uh, see, here, the, the, this picture, this drawing, is an indication of how to prove this inequality. Now we may wonder whether this inequality is actually an equality, or whether, whether here it would be, it, it would be strict, it, it would be really an inequality, whether, some, whether this configuration here can be bigger than the configuration there. So the, the second exercise, find a configuration 
of a two paths in a big network and a one path in a small network, such that we can, cannot redraw them back. You see? So the, the, the redrawing in this direction is always possible. That's what I claim. But the redrawing in the opposite direction is not always possible. So find a counterexample. Find, find a configuration which doesn't allow for such a redrawing. Uh, well, so, so, that's, uh, uh, so that's the end of the second part. We, we now saw two, two universes. One universe of uh, uh, Hermitian matrices, the other is the universe of uh, planar networks. They are governed exactly by the same set of inequalities. But uh, is it just uh, just a coincidence? Is it just by chance? Or is there some deeper reason for that? So in what follows, I'll try to show you some indications that there is, uh, there is a bigger story behind it. Uh, well, as I said already, it's, it's not completely understood. It's not completely finished. So that's why, well, we'll see how my explanations work. But at least I'll give you some indication. In fact, the story is as follows. There is a whole family of problems uh, with a parameter, with a real parameter, let's say tau. And, well, the tau equal to zero corresponds to Hermitian matrices with their eigenvalues. And tau equal, let's say, well, put it equal to plus infinity, corresponds to planar networks with their maximal multiparts. And in between, there is, there is a whole family of problems parameterized by the parameter tau. Well, I, of course, I should explain what, what this uh, u star n means and recall you what, uh, what is the notion of singular values. So u star n is just a group of upper triangular matrices with uh, positive reals on the diagonal and with a standard matrix product. So singular values is simply eigenvalues of b times b star, or sometimes people add a square root. So but that doesn't matter so much for our purposes. So, um, well, notice that the Lie algebra of this u star n is just a set of upper triangular matrices with uh, reals on the diagonal. And as a vector space, it's isomorphic to the space of Hermitian matrices, simply by mapping b to b plus b star. So recall, we, we saw this uh, theorem of KKS, of Kirill of Kostin Suryok, about Poisson structures on uh, duals to the Lie algebra. Here, here there, is, uh, there is an analog or a kind of uh, an analog of this theorem in, this, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Lie group world. It's, and I, uh, well, so, so different pieces or so different ideas were belong to Grinfeld, Simonov, Tenshansky, and to Lou Weinstein. So this group U star N carries a unique Poisson structure with the following properties. So the product map, the multiplication map is Poisson. So it's called the Poisson Lie group for this reason. So the Poisson bracket vanishes at the group unit. In fact, it's a consequence of the first property, but I just want to spell it out because we're going to need it. And then since the Poisson bracket at the group unit vanishes, the induced, there is an induced Poisson structure on the tangent space at the group unit. And the tangent space of the group unit is just the Lie algebra, which is isomorphic to Hn. So this induced Poisson st structure must be equal to KKS. So there is a unique Poisson structure which verifies this, uh, uh, these conditions. Your, your isomorphism, do you Sorry? want to say more? So you say that one guy is isomorphic to another guy. Here? Down below. Uh, the induced Poisson, where? Last row. Yes. So left hand side. Oh yeah. The, okay. Isomorph. Okay. That's the, let's say this this isomorphism. The isomorphism, right? I I, I said the right the uh, tangent space that the group unit is uh, isom canonical isomorphic. It is the definition of the Lie algebra, and here I show the isomorphism of the Lie algebra to the space H N. So here um, we should perhaps accelerate a little bit. And, well, I, uh, I would like to cite a highly non-trivial and still somewhat mysterious result due to Ginsburg and Weinstein. Uh, so this, uh, uh, this Poisson the group, this group of upper triangular matrices, U star N, with this Poisson structure, pi, is isomorphic as a Poisson space to 
uh, to the space of Hermitian matrices with the KKS Poisson structure. So it sounds simple, but well, by now I think there are maybe five different proofs of this result which use completely different ideas. So, and the isomorphism is not explicit. I'll show, I think it's explicit only in the case of uh, two by two matrices. I'll show you this, uh, this the formula in, in a second. But uh, this isomorphism gives rise to the following simple consideration. So KKS Poisson bracket is linear. And this implies that actually if you scale the bracket, if you multiply it by the scaling parameter tau, we get a Poisson space which is isomorphic to the Poisson space we started with. So this is just a rescaling of coordinates. But then this implies that the Poisson structure on U star n with a rescaled bracket is actually isomorphic to Hn with pi kks. So here that's not a vector space. So there is no simple rescaling, but still the combination of these two, two results shows that this is, this is correct. Now let me try to, to illustrate how it works in the two by two case. You see, so we're, we're back to our, to our two by two matrices, traces two by two matrices, and by the Ginsburg-Weinstein map, they should be mapped to upper triangular matrices. So here there is this, well, not very attractive formula, uh, but an explicit formula which shows how this map looks like. Well, let's try to make it, let's try to beautify it a little bit. So let's first put in the, the scaling parameter. So if we add the scaling parameter to it, then it would enter those exponentials. Now let's try to see what happens when tau is very big. In fact, the formula will simplify and becomes more beautiful. See here, this, this exponential is going to win against all the other exponentials. Then we can take a square root, and that's, that's, what, we, that's what we obtain. Notice that our action variables, these Gelfand cycling variables, z and r, they stay, they stand exactly in, this, uh, in the exponents of these functions in front of the scaling parameter tau. So uh, now we can see what's the relation to the, to the world of planar networks. In fact, planar networks, that's a way to write, to write down coordinates on the upper triangular group. And here you see, here I start cheating a little bit, but roughly speaking, parts in planar networks correspond to matrix elements. Here we are back to this, uh, to this simple planar network, and this one one uh, path which contains z corresponds to this matrix element, one two parts which contains r corresponds to this matrix element, and two two paths corresponds to this matrix element. Now, uh, also notice that uh, for this formula to be true, uh, normally, normally R, with the exception of the cases when Z is equal to plus minus R, R is bigger than Z and minus Z. That's what the interla interlacing inequality tells us. And that's exactly what's the condition for our M map to be of full rank. And this is not a coincidence. That's, well, we would need like much more time to, to really to really show it. I would need much more time to show it how it works, but this is already a kind of interesting phenomenon. Maybe the last thing to say here. Th so that's basically uh, seems to be the scheme how uh, completely integrable systems uh, can, can show up in this formalism. You see, uh, it was easy to define the gelfand cycling system here, but we needed Gilman and Stelz to tell us that we need to take eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices. Here, well, on the, on the right-hand side, we just take the, 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 the asymptotics of, the, of those exponentials and the, just those exponents, they would automatically be action variables. So you see that's, we, I, I would like to view it as a kind of machinery how to obtain those, um, those action variables. Now, perhaps one more speculation and then some examples of the problems that we would like to solve with this machinery. Uh, so, in the in a more general case, one of the uh, ways to obtain Ginsburg-Weinstein maps is by using irregular uh, irregular flat connections. So, this uh, th th that's the formula for an irregular flat connection on the uh, uh, on the complex plane without zero. Uh, there is there is a theorem of bulge 
which says that the, uh, the map mapping the, the residue, this A, into the Stokes data of this connection is an example of a Ginsburg-Weinstein map. Well, notice that if we introduce tau in this business, so then this tau will be in front of uh, over differential D over dz. And, uh, well, so the, uh, the, the suggestion of Igor Kritcher there is that most probably if we send tau to infinity, then the, uh, the, standard, uh, the standard treatment inside the Adler-Costin scheme if you treat Z now as a spectral parameter, this would probably produce for us the way to interpret the asymptotics of the Stokes matrices in terms of the action variables of the, of the integrable system defined by the L operator standing here. So this, this is a work in progress. It probably it works this way, but, uh, but we don't know yet. Now, maybe some examples of the problems that we really want to solve with this formalism. One of them uh, is trying to find girlfriend site in uh, integrable system on the so-called multiplicity spaces. So uh, here, well, again, I probably have to accelerate a little bit and give somewhat less detailed explanations. So let's consider a pair of quadrant orbits. For instance, for UN, this would be conjugacy classes in Fermission matrices, and consider uh, the symplectic quotient at some level nu. Uh, well, by the marginal Weistern reduction, this is a symplectic space. And this is one of the interesting questions, how to find action angle variables of Gelfand site and type on this space. This problem is not completely straightforward to solve because essentially it's not very easy to describe functions. To if, well, of course, we understand that functions on this portion, these are simply G invariant functions on the product of two orbits but how to, how to find good functions which would be similar to eigenvalues. This is not completely clear. In fact, uh, well, uh, whether this space is, uh, is empty or non-empty, that, that goes under the name of the Horn problem. And the solution of the Horn problem, that's, uh, that's a difficult thing which was obtained by Klaschko and Knutzen and Tau some years ago. And uh, in this conference, in the least theory section, there will be a talk of Nikola Rissev, who speaks about, I, I think it will be about more complicated problems of the same type. But uh, so that's what the planar network theory can, can offer for, for this problem. You see now, if we have two matrices, we can put together two planar networks. It's sufficient to take one of them to be just of this very simple type because essentially this G action allows you to diagonalize one of the matrices, for instance, A or B. And then, well, uh, the weights on this, uh, uh, on this planar network, they will be essentially the action variables of the new integrable system. So you see, like, uh, this would correspond again to, the, to some asymptotic behavior of the exponentials. In the, uh, in the triangular matrices, but in the planar network language, that's, that's just, uh, just going to be the answer, most probably. That's, that's also a work in progress, but here I have not much of a doubt. Um, I would like to end uh, with the problem of Gelfand Zeitin for symplectic, for symplectic matrices, and that's, uh, uh, the, I think that, 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 that was one of the ideas for my master thesis, which uh, hasn't worked. So you see, for uh, it's, it's more or less known how triangular tableau for symplectic matrices should look like. We know every second row, essentially because sp to n minus 1 does not exist. So here, OK, there are different proposals or different attempts to, to write various things here within representation theory and also within symplectic geometry. But basically, right, the question is what one writes in those, uh, in those odd rows. Now, it turns out that the, uh, for, for the symplectic group, there are planar networks again. These are just some planar networks with symmetry. See, this is an example of a planar network which corresponds to, uh, to a symplectic story. So here, the symmetry is by exchange, exchanging x to minus x and y to minus y. And, and here, it's symmetric. It's a to a, c to c. And then those a, b, c, d, x, and y will be action variables. So that's, that's the proposal 
for the answer. So I hope there will be more more questions to treat with this new method. And well, this method, well, at the moment, it just one or two examples, but I hope that uh, there will be uh, there will be a more detailed scheme which would emerge on the way. I think it's probably time to stop. Thank you. <laughs> So the coefficients of the um, characteristic polynomial are the uh, elementary symmetric functions. Do you have a topical? Uh, uh, yes, sure. So um, yes, so here the idea is as follows. Um, basically, we, we think that everything behaves exponentially, right? So they, they have exponential growth, so exponential decay. Now, the symmetric function is a sum of products. Among these products, there is one which is so so right. That's that, that's that, that's the answer that I'm using. So just uh, just the 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 the, uh, the the product of the or whatever the sum. If you tropicalize the sum of top eigenvalues, all the others you simply discard. That, 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 that's why the tropical problems solve in a much easier fashion. That's that's basically the reason, right? Another question. So you said uh, that you want to address these open problems using your new method. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I'm somehow lost. Uh, can you summarize the steps in your new method? Oh, yeah, OK. Of course, of course you're right. I mean, um, I take it part as a question and part as a criticism. Because, no, I mean, it, and this, this, would be, this would be right to treat it this way. Certainly, I tried to, 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 to sweep under the rug the, the, uh, the details. Or the, basically, OK, so let's, let, let's put it this way. Um, so one, one starts, let's, let, let's, let's, let's take an example that we saw in the talk. So one starts with Hermitian matrices. Then one replaces the Hermitian matrices with upper triangular matrices, right? So one has to pass from duals of Lie algebras to Poisson Lie groups. And in the Poisson Lie groups, one has to consider some kind of tropical limit. So this tropical limit, uh, at least at the moment, it needs some special coordinate system. I didn't explain too much. So those uh, planar networks, they give you special coordinate systems in which a tropical limit works nicely. At the moment, it further involves a little bit of analysis and symplectic geometry, because in order to control the limit, one needs to use some estimates on limited volumes. So basically, that would be a short outline, but I didn't speak of much of what. OK, so one more. I, I did one. I did just one simple suggestion. Uh, there was an old question of computing uh, Correlation functions uh, in the integral or intermediate system called the distance over integral. Mm -hmm. The answer for those correlation functions was written as a sum of, of moduli square of certain rational function of the weights, of Kirpansi and weights, uh, over passes. Mm -hmm. And it looks like that this answer should have a meaning in the planar network sign. Because so passes are passes that enter there, are passes on the hypothetical of the law. Which are exactly something that you were right. Sounds so perfect. To, to discuss, just, to be discussed. Okay, so before ending the uh, this session, I would like to deliver some small souvenir for the speakers. Thank you very much.